So with GTFO going into early access on the 9th, I wanted to briefly discuss my thoughts about how I found the game during the alpha and beta, and share my experiences and tips about how interesting the game mechanics are. In case you don't know, GTFO is a hardcore 4 player co-op stealth action game made by 10 Chambers Collective. It's a first person shooter with a survival horror twist and it forces you and your team to communicate and coordinate. Created by only 9 people, two of which Payday veterans will be familiar with, Simon Vicklin and Ulf Anderson, both who left Overkill some years ago to start working on this project of theirs. Basically, you and up to three other prisoners are sent plummeting down into what's known as The Complex, a massive hole in the ground extending hundreds of meters down, to complete expeditions, which are objectives tasked to you by an entity known as The Warden. The further down you go, the harder the expeditions get. I want to discuss the use of an interesting game mechanic called Terminals. To do so, I'd like to talk about the beta's first expedition. Floor A Expedition 1, which is shorthanded to just A1, is tasking us with exploring the complex in order to find 12 personal ID cards, which are required in order to access something in Expedition B1. This means you have to complete certain expeditions before gaining access to new ones. In A1, you arrive in Zone 38. Now the map layout is split into zones, which can start at any random number. In this case, it was 38. In each zone, you will have a different amount of subsections or areas labeled with a letter. The amount of areas can vary greatly. In this instance, Zone 38 only had two, Area A and Area B. But this can go up to as many as 11 or more, since in the alpha, there was an Area K. Areas are usually separated by some sort of door, but can also be connected openly, as was the case with Zone 38 here. Each area usually contains a various amount of enemies, which is where the stealth comes into play. The enemies in the game all lay kind of dormant. They can't see, so they rely on detecting movement and sounds. Since resources like ammo and health are scarce, most of the time, you want to use your infinite resources, aka your melee, to remove as many enemies as possible. Basically, with these enemies called sleepers, they have a heartbeat that glows red. When they are glowing, it means they are actively sensing around itself for movement. If it detects movement in this stage, it will go into a beating stage. If in this stage it detects movement, it will notice you and go hostile. However, more often than not, you will have a chance to kill the enemy because they need to kind of cry out to alert the whole room. If there are sleepers grouped together, this becomes much harder since the ones in the immediate vicinity will also get alerted and trying to melee them all without one crying out is a lot harder. The nice part about the stealth in this game is that compared to Payday 2, where it was usually all or nothing, every kill made in stealth is usually permanent progress towards your end objective, and alerting enemies doesn't make the entire level go hostile. Instead, it will only be limited to the areas you're in. This is true in most cases except with the enemy special called the Scout. If the scout is alerted, not only will the enemies in the area get alerted, but it will also spawn additional enemies, usually from somewhere behind you to flank your retreat. And after going through a firefight, you will usually be wanting to try and find resources to replenish what you just used up. But often you use up more than you gain, and here is where planning comes into play. In the game, there are terminals which are incredibly useful tools for planning out what to do. The terminal comes with three basic commands. List, query, and ping. And no, Hello World doesn't do anything, sadly. Anyway, list allows you to search for any number of things. Simply typing list with nothing else will show you absolutely everything in the level, and the terminal splits it into three identifying sections. Object ID, object type, and object status. Query is useful for finding out more information about select items, such as their location, which query will state, but only the zone the item is in, not the area. Ping is for finding out the area of a given item, but it can only be used on terminals within the same zone as the item you're trying to ping. Now, querying items like security keys, 
isn't much of a hassle, since there are only a few of them and you usually need to get them. But with the Baders A1, the objective is multiple items. We need to get 12 of the 17 to 18 IDs in the level, and most people are not going to want to type out 18 different 7 character ID strings and their locations. Which is where list filters come in handy. The list command can have up to two filters on it, narrowing down the results for which you can then query. Here I want to bring up some mistakes I've made previously and seen other people make. You can type in the zone number to list the items that appear in that zone. For instance, list 43 will bring up everything in zone 43, which is great and you can further narrow that down by adding ID or ammo pack or medipack or anything else really. However, there is a bit of a funny thing with this. Not only will it show you everything within that zone, but if there are items that happen to have the zone number, in this case 43, in their object ID, they will also show up. I noticed this a few times when a zone said it had more ammo than it actually did, or two security keys were in the same zone. I initially thought it was a bug, but no, it was because I didn't define my filters enough. So in order to successfully narrow your list down to a zone, you will need to use the wording zone underscore zone number. For instance, list zone underscore 43. This will only show items within that zone and anything that has 43 within its object ID that isn't within that zone will not show up. This may seem a bit pedantic, but it's an important bit of knowledge to have since with A1 from the beta, the personal IDs we needed contained a lot of numbers within them, and multiple IDs easily contain zone numbers which can get caught up within your filtered results. Now, with this knowledge, instead of querying every single item, you can find out how many objective items are in each zone and then plan your moves accordingly. To give a use case, in A1, from the main room you have three areas to explore. Zone 41 and 42 are normal areas that are easily accessible. Zone 43 and 44 have an alarm security door in order to access. And Zone 39 and 40 require a security key in order to unlock. Listing all the IDs in each area, you can figure out the minimum amount of rooms you need to go into. In the example I'm showing you, there are only 17 ID cards. In the zones behind the security key door, there are five of them. In the alarm security door, there's seven. And in the normal section, there are five. However, taking into account that the security key needed for two of the zones is past the alarm door, it means no matter what choice we make, we have to go through that alarm door. Past that door to zone 43, there are three IDs and the security key. However, there is yet another alarm door that goes to zone 44, where four IDs are. And here is where we can start to make more meaningful choices. We could elect to fight another wave of enemies to get four IDs, and then go to the first zone of each of the other directions to gather five IDs. Or we could ignore the four keys past that door and save ourselves the hassle of fighting and doing bioscans, and instead go collect the IDs from every other zone. And this is the beauty of the terminals in GTFO. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share with you a few other helpful tips that I found useful when using the terminal. When determining if the yield from an area or zone is worth going guns blazing or not, I like to do a list resources zone number. This shows you the resources within that zone. However, what's important here is that if you query a resource ID, it will tell you specifically how many charges are in that item. So if you need ammo and the zone you're going into has ammo, it can be worthwhile querying that ammo in that zone and finding out how much refill you're going to get from it. If it's only one or two charges, it might not be worth it to detour into that zone. Other things that I didn't find a use for in the limited alpha and beta, but could very well be important for other expeditions is the ability to filter the list to an object type or an object status. The object type is useful since the main one you'll be looking up is resources, but you can also do storage. This is useful because if you list a zone's resources and then its storage and find out there are more storage containers than resources, 
it can highly suggest that an objective item or other consumable item like seafoam grenade, fog repellent or glow sticks could be in there. Unfortunately, querying a box or locker does not return its content, nor if it needs to be hacked or not. Then you have objective types like security, which keys fall under, identification items, which are just the IDs needed from the A1 expedition, terminal is also an object type as well. The object type called passage are doors, which interestingly can be queried to give additional information about it, such as navigation info. AKA when you approach the door, which zone it leads to and what zones are past that. And it will also tell you the zones and the further zones it leads to when you're on the other side of the door. It does not, however, tell you if the door is alarmed or if it requires a key or bioscan. Then you have object type unknown. Currently, hydrostasis units or HSUs fall under this, but I'm sure there will be multiple other things that can fall under this category in the future. Lastly, onto listing object status. In both the beta and the alpha, there was no need for this information since the state of items are either normal, deactivated, or malfunctioning. However, I reckon come the early access on the 9th that certain expeditions may require us to repair or turn on objectives, and you could see where this can come in handy. Other minor things that you most likely know are that you can hit up on the arrow to go back to previously typed commands. This is useful when listing resources or IDs for multiple zones, as I always try to put the zone as the second filter and can just backspace the last two characters, making it much faster. You can also hit tab to autofill commands, not particularly useful and it doesn't save too much time, but it's always there. Actually, in the beta expedition B1, there is a special terminal that has unique commands and I did find it useful there. And that about does it for my list of information that I've personally discovered with terminals. There is so much more that GTFO is going to have that wasn't even in the alpha or beta that I for one am super eager to discover, like leveling up and unlocking systems, and I believe they did mention the existence of some endgame content, perhaps similar to other games Prestige, as well as other enemy types that we haven't seen yet or have been teased, like the Shadow Creature. So if you're looking forward to seeing more GTFO content, get followed and consider subscribing as I will certainly be talking a lot more about it. Not sure how making content on it will go given how the rundown mechanic works, but I will be streaming most everything I do, so if you want to see things that are happening, twitch.tv slash randomkenny. I'll be streaming a couple hours after the game comes out, which is about 12pm Pacific Standard Time on the 9th, so maybe around... 3 to 5 p.m. PST time. It'll be early morning for me, so it's hard to say, but if you want more GTFO content before release, I'll be uploading a beta A1 duo run and a B1 trio run in the next day or two, both commentary free. <laughs> Hell, maybe I'll even make lore videos on GTFO. <laughs> I'll do it, I swear. Definitely working on a Payday 2 video explaining where things are at. That that's a thing, and uh, but that's that's about all. Okay, have a good one, boy. Boy, now.